Now I'm going to be reading some verses out of Romans. Now there are some preachers that say that the whole book of Romans is for Christians. And they will use chapter 8 verse 13 as if it were speaking to Christians. But it's not. Because it says in Romans 8.13 For if ye live after the flesh. If you're living after the flesh, then that means you're lost. Because that's what people, lost people do. They don't live in the spirit. They live in the flesh. They do what they want to do. So right here is if ye, the ye is lost people. If you're living after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the spirit do modify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. So like I've said before, to, to become a child of God, to be born again, you have to lose your life, which die to self. You need to die to self. And when you die to self, then you will have life in Jesus. Now in Romans 7, 5, it says, For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Okay, this fruit unto death, it means, uh, it means that you're walking in the flesh. You're walking in the flesh. And when you're walking in the flesh, you're going to commit sins like adultery, uh, envy. You're going to want what other people have. It's just stuff like that, lying, killing. And I'm not talking about physical, physical death. I'm talking about, you know, the tongue talks about how you can t kill with your tongue, saying things about people. Well, these are the fruits that are unto death. These are not fruits of the Lord. And then Romans 8, 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. What is in Christ Jesus? What does that mean? Well, the answer is right, is, is the very next statement. The rest of that verse says, Who walk not after the flesh, meaning your own ways, but after the Spirit. You walk after the Spirit. You walk after the Lord. That is what that's what it means when you're in Christ Jesus, being in the Spirit. You're walking the way the Lord wants you to walk and not in the flesh, which is, that's the way you want to walk. Romans 8, 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you, now if any man not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. He's a non-Christian. Now I read out of the King James because that's what I study, the King James. And sometimes it's hard to understand what the verses are saying. And that's why I'm teaching it. So you can understand what these verses are talking about. And this verse right here is plainly just talking about a non-Christian. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of God, he is none of his. You don't belong to the Lord. That's what it's talking about. Also, in Romans 9, 8, that is... They which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. So right here is just saying again that if if you're walking in the flesh, then you're not one of his children. That's pretty much what it says right here. If you're walking in the flesh, doing what you want to do. Matthew twenty four thirteen. Here's another verse that uh, some religions use as losing your salvation. It says, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. So right here, it sounds like, well, you have to endure to the end to be saved or you'll lose it. If you read Matthew 24, Matthew 24, they ask Jesus, When are you coming? When is the end time? So Jesus is talking about the tribulation here. Now, I can go into detail here, but I have a teaching, and it's called The Last Days, and I speak about all that. But right here, it's talking about tribulation. People in the tribulation, it is them that endure to the end. They shall be saved. But us as Christians, this is not for Christians in, the, in this time. This is for Christians that are going to go through the tribulation. And if you, like I said, if you want to know about that, I have a tape on it called Last Days. Galatians chapter 1 verse 22 and 23 it says in the body of his flesh through death meaning about when he died on the cross when he died on the cross he was and we accepted that we believe in that and accepted it and gave, and gave him our lives because of that 
now he can present you holy and unblameable and unre unreprovable in his sight. Meaning, now you're right in his eyes. When we accept Jesus Christ in our hearts, now we're right. Not morally right, but right in the spirit. Verse 23. If ye continue in the faith, grounded, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Now right here, if ye continue. If you continue. Remember, I've talked about Judas, how he didn't continue. And it talked about the disciples, how they walked away. They didn't continue. And remember what I said in 1 John 2.19. It says, people of the Lord, born again Christians, they would no doubt have continued with us. It says, no doubt. So part of proving that you're a born again Christian is, is the fruits, walking in the Spirit, but also your your endurance. It doesn't. And I'm not saying what I said earlier in Matthew 24:13 that you have to endure. But if you're a child of God, you will endure. It's not that you have to, but you will, because you've truly given your heart to Him. Hebrews 10 verses 26 through 29. Now, before I read them, chapters 8, 9, and 10 speak about Jesus dying once on the cross. But in Hebrews 10:26, it says for for if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sin. <clears throat> this is, <clears throat> excuse me, this is meaning people who reject the Lord, there is no other way to get rid of your sins, but by this one sacrifice. In verse ten, in verse ten, it says that Jesus offers his body once and for all, and also in verse eighteen. It says, when sin is forgiven, there is no more reason for sacrifice to take place again. Now, let me just say this. Um, the Catholics, the Mass, that's heresy. It's opposed to the Word of God. They sacrifice the Lord every Sunday. And right here, the Word of God says there was only one sacrifice, once. He died once. And, um, and the Catholics seem to do it every Sunday because the the, the bread and the wine, they speak about how that is how how it becomes the true blood and body of Christ. So they sacrifice them every Sunday, and I'm sorry that's just plain heresy because it goes against the Word of God. I point this out because anything that goes against the Word of God, I have to point it out so you'll so you'll know you'll know uh, if you read your Bible you'll see these things. We don't follow man. No matter what, he, if he's a priest, a preacher, uh, the Lord has men of God and, and they preach the word, but there's also the, also the Lord says there's wolves out there and they don't speak the truth. They're in it for, uh, for their own glory, for their own honor. I don't mean to offend anyone out there, but I will give you the word of God and what it says. Verse 27, but a certain fearful looking, looking for a judgment and fury indignation which shall devour the adversary this is meaning looking forward to God's anger at his wrath because his anger his wrath is coming verse 28 he that despises Moses law died without mercy under two or three witnesses meaning you know what you're doing when you sin it wasn't out of ignorance you were stoned to death for some of them back then those of you who might remember the the woman they brought in adultery and they told Jesus you know that we should stone her because she committed adultery but that's what it's talking about they they brought that prostitute over to that woman and they had two to three witnesses to to prove that yes she, she was committing adultery so they were ready to stone her and this is what it's talking about in verse 29 just think how much worse the punishment will be for those who have trampled on the Son of God and have treated the blood of the covenant which made us holy as if we were common and unholy and have insulted and disdained, meaning, outra mean, meaning outraged, the Holy Spirit who brings God's mercy to us. Now I read this out of the Living Bible because it was easier 
to understand. Again, like I said, these apostate people being stoned to death is nothing compared to what's coming. Just like the prostitute woman, her if she was stoned to death, that's nothing compared to what to God's anger that will be coming. His wrath is coming. And we and, and we and believe me, you don't want to be here. And if you want to know more about it, it's in my C D, my teaching, The Last Days. Now, there are some people who take once saved, always saved, they take that expression and they use it as a license to sin. In Romans chapter 3, verses 5 through 8. But some might say, Our sinfulness serves a good purpose, for it helps people see how righteous God is. Isn't it unfair then for Him to punish us? This is a merely human point of view. Of course not. If God were not entirely fair, how would He be qualified to judge the world? But someone might still argue, How can God condemn me as a sinner if my dishonesty highlights His truthfulness and brings Him more glory? And some people even slander us by claiming that we say, The more we sin, the better it is. Those who say such things deserve to be condemned. Now what, what Romans is saying here is, These people who say, Well, I'm making God look good. Because how bad I am and how and how he is so just and fair to forgive me. Right here, Romans is talking totally against that. Those who do such things deserve to be condemned to the judgment. So people who think this way, it's wrong. It's wrong that you think you're doing God a favor by being bad. Romans 6, verses 1 through 4. It says, Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of His wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined Him in His death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Uh, you know, I wish people read their Bible. I wish they would read their Bible. Because there, there's too many people out there who just go on what the pastor says or the priest. Because uh, this day thing, a lot of people think, well, you know, because he's a priest or he's a preacher, you know, he knows everything. Well, we don't. I'm a teacher, and I'll tell you right now, I don't know everything. And I there's no preacher or priest who knows everything. Okay? Only the Lord. So, if you would read your Bible and read verses like this, you will see how it is to walk with the Lord. What to do and what not to do. Now, let me talk about backsliders. These are Christians who sin, who may go back into the world, you know, for a small period of time. Uh, might, you know, might be just one fall or... They might fall from the Lord for a month, maybe two. But a, cru a true born-again Christian will not stay in the world. He'll come back to the Lord. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, Do not listen to an ac accusation against an elder unless it is confirmed by two or three witnesses. So if you hear something about a, a, a deacon or some an elder in the church, don't believe it. Don't believe it unless it is, it is proven by two or three witnesses that whatever it was is true. Because believe me, there's a lot of times people who are not born again, lost people, they like to accuse Christians as doing something. And they make it worse than what it is just to make them look bad. And right here it says don't do it. Unless you have two or three witnesses that say, yes, he did. Then he says not to believe it. And verse 20. Those who sin should be reprimanded in front of the whole church. This will serve as a strong warning to others. So those Christians, born again Christians who sin, should, there's, there's, a, there's a place in the Bible where it talks about if there's a brother, and it's a Christian because it calls him a brother, that if he's uh, 
living in a, a sinful life back in the world, then two or three should go to him and, and talk to him about coming back. But if he doesn't come back, then you take it before the church. And if he still doesn't want to repent and come back to the Lord, then it says to to kick him out of church. And right here, the Lord says this is, will serve as a strong warning to others that, you know, being a Christian is a very serious thing to the Lord. You don't say you're a Christian and you go out there and live like the devil. That's playing games, and you don't play games with the Lord. So if you know anybody like that, or even if you're like that, I would I would repent and stop, because the Lord does not like that. First Corinthians chapter five verses nine through thirteen. It says, "I wrote unto you in an epistle, not to a com- not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with fornicators of this world, or with covetous or extortioners, or with idolaters. For then must your needs go out of the world." And what Paul, what Paul is saying here is, don't. There, these are not our friends. We don't run around with them. We're in this world, but we're not of the world. That's what the what the Word of God says. And we can't help but be around them. But we're we're not to join them in their in their sinful ways, not living for the Lord. That's pretty much what it's saying here. We got to be around them, but we don't. We don't fellowship with them. We don't run with them. And then verse 11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such as one not to eat. He's saying... Keep yourselves from backsliders. Just like I said earlier, uh, if, as a, a person who doesn't want to repent, they're supposed to be kicked out of church. When they're kicked out of church, it says right here not not to even eat with them. Not to even eat with them. We pray for them that they'll repent and come back to the Lord, but we're not supposed to have fellowship with them. And in verse 12, For what have I to do to judge them also that are without Meaning people who are lost without Jesus. That's what that means. Do not ye judge them that are within? Don't we judge those who are Christians? That's what Matthew chapter 7 speaks about, verses 1 through 4. It says, you know, a lot of people always quote, well, you shouldn't judge other people. You're not supposed to judge. Well, no, they're not reading the Bible because the Bible says, if you do judge, the Lord says, if you do judge, this is the way you judge. And he says in Matthew uh, chapter 7, 1 through 4, he says, Make sure there's no beam in your eye before you try to take a speck out of someone else's eye. So what he's saying is, uh, make sure you're not committing the same sin that you're trying to correct a brother about. So it doesn't say, no, you cannot judge at all. The Lord says, no, yes, you can, but this is the way you do it. Now in verse 13, but them that are without God judgeth, meaning the Lord will judge the lost people. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Again, it's talking about the backslider. Put away the wicked person. If he doesn't have fellowship with the church, the Lord says, then he doesn't have fellowship with him also. In Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 through 14, there is much more we would like to say about this. But it's difficult to explain, especially since you are spiritually dull and don't seem to listen. You have been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching others. Instead, you need someone to teach you, again, the basic things about God's Word. You are like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. For someone who lives on milk and is still an infant doesn't know how to do what is right. Solid food is for those who are mature, who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. Now, these are backsliding Christians again. They're, they're not growing. Instead of growing, they're backsliding. It says that they're spiritually dull. dull. So I say these are Christians here because you're not going to call a lost person. You're not going to say a, a lost person has the spirit at all. 
and you're not going to say to a lost person, you ought to be teaching, but instead you're like a baby. So we're talking about Christians here. Like I said, the Lord doesn't tell a lost person to teach the Bible. Then in Hebrews 6, which it continues from chapter 5, it addresses, it addresses to the backslider. So I'm going to read Hebrews 6, 1 through 12. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying aside the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptism, and of laying on of hands, and of the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this will we do, if God permits. Verse 4. If it is impossible, impossible for those who were once enlightened, and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good work of God, and the powers of the world to come. Unless you move forward, this is what, unless you're moving forward, you know, you're already saved, but you're not moving forward, is what it's saying. If they shall fall away, now this is not losing your, you're losing your salvation. This does not mean you're losing your salvation. If they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance. Like in verse 1, you need to be saved. It's talking about, you know, don't forget all this up here that you've been taught already. All right? That's what it's saying. If they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify themselves to the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. So what is pretty much what it's saying here is that you don't lose your salvation, but you're showing people what you're showing people, even though it's not true, what you're showing people is God is unable to keep you. And believe me, there is nothing that God cannot do. With God, everything is possible. But these verses here are showing, if they shall fall away, religions take this a lot of times that you've lost your salvation. It's not talking about salvation here. It means if you fall away from what you had been taught earlier, back in verses 1, 2, and 3. That's what it's talking about. If you if you sidetrack from that, then you need to, then you need to repent. So, that's what verses 1 through 6 are talking about. In verse 7, For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh off on upon it, and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed, received blessings from God. For when you are growing, this is what it means, for when you are growing, you receive blessings from the God. That's what this means. When you are growing, the Lord will bless you. Blessings will come automatically to you. He rewards his children. And believe me, he blesses, I know. In verse 8, But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. What's that word nigh mean? Close. First Peter 4.18 says, If the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinners appear? So there will be Christians who just barely make it. This is what verse 8 is talking about when it, when it says not unto cursing. They, they just barely made it. And then I back that up with 1 Peter 4.18 where it says they scarcely be saved. They just barely made it. But back to verse 9 it says, But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we, though we thus speak. What it's saying right here, what follows salvation is works. But again, works don't save you. Verse 10, For God is not righteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward his name, and that you have ministered to the saints and to, the, and to minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligently to the full assurance of hope unto the end. Verse 12, that you be not slothful, meaning they're not, bring forth, they're not bringing forth good fruit. Verse 7, they are not going to have rewards in heaven. Back in verse 7, that's what it's talking about. But he says not to be slothful, not to bring forth, that, you, that you're not to bring forth bad fruit, but good fruit. And then it says, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promise. 
meaning those who are walking with the Lord through faith and patience will inherit His promise. And His promise to us is being saved, going to heaven.